to uh, Highman's inaugural event, Flash to Bank Part 1, which we will be discussing the creative aspect of bringing a product to market. Flash to Bank Part 2, planned for early next year, we'll talk about the business side of it. Um, hope you've all enjoyed your breakfast. Uh, we, be, we've been very lucky to secure some well-respected speakers today, all experts in the field. Um, and first of all, I'd like to introduce to you award-winning designer, uh, Oliver Blackwell. Good morning. Um, I was asked by Vicky to come and talk to you today about new product development, ideas, how do you generate a new product? And um, often people say to me, um, how do you come up with that great idea? And they think that it's the, sort of the classic light bulb that something suddenly comes to you. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite as, uh, as easy as that. And I think it comes down to the way you pose a question for a new design brief. So what I'm going to ask you to do, um, if you've all got a pen and paper, I'm going to give you 10 seconds um, to draw me a picture of a car. Okay, go. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, stop. Okay, could I ask you to put the mum show me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. The general consensus, although there's some uh, some sort of anomalies there, is a is a, a saloon esque vehicle with wheels at the front and wheels at the back. Um, this is something that I drew earlier on. Probably not in ten seconds. Um, has anyone got any idea why I've actually drawn a helicopter and, and not a car, as I quite clearly ask? What is a car? What is a car, absolutely. The point is, it's all about asking the correct design brief, rather than, you've already got a preconceived idea about a car. It's uh, something that goes on the road, it's got wheels. Whereas if I was to say to you, design me a method to get you from A to B, you could have conceivably come up with the helicopter. I'm going to talk to you now about three products that I've worked on, and all have come from um, an idea. Um, this one has come from a frustration. Um, people think that the bath scenario, the idea, the big bang, um, comes to you if you're, if you're born with this ability, but actually it's a lot of research. It's, a, it's understanding the technical capabilities. It's understanding the taking opinions of experts. And this product came about from a frustration using an extension lead, cutting the grass. And I experienced three problems. The first one was tangles. The second one was getting the cable caught up. And the third one was um, the plug being pulled out. So what did I do about it? I identified the problem. That was the, that was the first task. So I'm a big believer in making prototypes. Um, doesn't matter how complicated, how simple. This was actually a basketball, uh, a cable, cable tie, bit of MDF which took all of a minute to cut out, some duct tape uh, and a plug. It was the first prototype, but what it proved to me was that I'd actually achieved something that was quite manoeuvrable and also that the plug would roll down and drag in the mud. So I very quickly changed that. Um, this was the outcome. So there was a lot of engineering that went into developing this product. So the product's called Revolution Ball. Um, and it's a cable reel that follows you around. Its features are that the cable can't get into a tangle because the cable can only go into the slot on the back. It's got an ergonomic handle, which means whether you've got arthritic hands or whether you're wearing gloves, you can easily wind the product up. The plug is also clamped in by the handle, which means you can work up a ladder and you can literally drag, the, drag the, the, the ball around with you and you can't pull the plug out at any, any point. Um, this video is to show testing. Um, I'm a big believer in making prototypes and I'm a big believer in testing the product. So 
the big advocate to this is, is obviously sort of James Dyson and how he markets the, the fact that we test our products because I know in their <coughs> early days they had a lot of problems with people thought the products weren't very good. Um, so they, what they've done is they've gone the absolutely extremity and they're testing the product over and over and over again. Um, which means obviously when you release the product into the field, um, you're, you're reassured you don't have any returns or any problems. Particularly, we, I was talking earlier to some of the, uh, the new rapid prototyping um, processes that there's huge benefit for using new manufacturing techniques in developing products because you can actually do mechanical tests before you bring the product to market, preventing problems uh, later on. Here's a, here was another mechanical test. So this was checking how the, um, how the pivot inside there, how it would wear after thousands of, um, thousands of cycles. And this one was working out how the bearings would wear inside. There was uh, three brass rings inside, so a basic slip, slip ring that allowed the plug to be static, so this would be static, and yet obviously the cable could then rotate. And this product was actually manufactured in the Far East, and uh, I had great problems with the manufacturing partners there. So I had the first, first prototype came back the, uh, from the injection molded tool parts, and they were um, a little bit resistant, they were a little bit too, uh, too stiff. So I actually had to go to the factory in, Korea, in, in China and say, polish. And uh, I spent 20 minutes in the boardroom, and then I flew back the following day. And that was purely just because the components hadn't been polished. So, um, there's a lot to be said for, for cheap Far East manufacturing, um, but then uh, being able to drive just down the road and resolve the problem would be, would be much easier. Um, so the second product I'm going to talk to you about um, is a gun holster. Um, I was approached by a client in Somerset who supply uh, the military, the police and the special forces with um, equipment of various sorts. Um, health and safety over the last 10 years has gone mad, as, as probably everyone is aware of. One of the issues that they had was there's a huge company in America that make gun holsters. They are a uh, market leader, however they have three latches that prevent the weapon falling out. So if you imagine you're a policeman, you're chasing a or over a fence, and um, you need three means of preventing your weapon falling out onto the ground and someone picking it up. However, that does present a slight problem if someone's just about to shoot at you and go, oh, hold on, one, <laughs> two. So the client said, we've got, we've got this problem, we cannot get around the regulation, we need three, three methods of retaining the, the weapon, but we want to improve the product, we want to increase the speed of draw. So how do we do it? Well, so the, the classic cowboy sling is the ideal scenario, it's loose, you can bring the weapon out, and you can fire the, fire the gun accurately. So I did a lot of studies into how people behave when someone's just about to shoot at you, what your, body, what your body does, how it reacts, where your hands go, where you think your weapon is. And in taking the information from this study, I realized that we could manipulate your hand so that only you being shot at would deactivate all of the mechanisms. So this, this was the outcome. It's actually got three locks on, but each lock deactivates the preceding lock. So this is a slider here that moves down. This unlocks an internal lock, and then when you pull the weapon up, it rotates the hood back. So if I was to try and grab the weapon from you as a bystander, I would be to uh, at a totally the wrong angle to activate all of, the, all of the mechanisms. Also, what I realized was that the current holsters were very large, they were cumbersome, and they actually meant that the way you grab the weapon <coughs> didn't allow you to react to interact with the weapon in the correct manner. So if I go back to the previous slide, the ideal position is where your finger is parallel with the barrel, which means you will get a better shot. So what, what we did with the design is we manipulated the way your fingers would hold it. So this guide here, which you can see in the white, moved your fingers so that when the weapon came out of the holster, it was perfectly parallel with the barrel, creating a more accurate shot. Um, when developing a product, I, I think there's probably two critical elements. One is the fact you know your manufacturing processes, so you know the capabilities of prototyping, you know your capabilities of your manufacturing partner. You know where the products can be manufactured, whether it's, whether it's a price point where it has to be manufactured in the Far East because there's a high level of assembly, 
or whether you can realistically design it so that it can be made in the UK, it might be made by you reducing the number of components, you're reducing the assembly process, or you might be using some automation. The other element is involve an expert straight away. And the reason I say this is because all of the products I've worked on, I haven't just miraculously developed them, I've obtained the information from someone in that field. And by obtaining the best information, you end up with a better product. So I own a medical devices company um, with this GP. And he's actually, funny enough, he's my GP that I went to see about my dislocated shoulder. And every time I went to see him, he said, oh, I've got this idea, do you want to work with me? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to work with you, thank you. And anyway, the shoulder persisted, so I had to keep going back to see the doctor. And then you know, I eventually gave in, and this was two years ago. Um, we developed a couple of products, of which I will show you one of them. Um, it's called the all-in-one urine pot, and it's come purely from him saying to me, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And although the inspiration was instant, and it was a matter of a back of a cigarette packet sketch, the development has actually taken 18 months, and it's three, three very basic plastic parts. What I'll do now is talk you through the current urine testing process. <coughs> it's slow, unhygienic, and unpleasant for medical staff. It happens many millions of times a day around the world. So this is what happens. The doctor will give the patient an empty pot. The patient will fill it up and give it back to the doctor. The doctor will then put on gloves, walk over to the sink, place the pot down, unscrew the lid, dip a reagent stick in, out and then scrape it on the edge. Um, just to give you a little story at this point, um, I've got two, two GPs which are my other directors for this business. Um, one of them knocked a pot of urine into her keyboard a couple of weeks ago. Uh, doesn't get worse than that. So anyway, she's a big advocate of this product as you, as you will see. Um, so you dip the stick in, you've taken it out and you've then got to wave this urine soaked stick against the, the chart on the side of the pot. And it's a pretty tricky process because you're meant to use a watch, although doctors never do. I hope there's no doctors in here that I've offended. Um, you're meant to, meant to use a stopwatch and read the results off at 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and at two minutes. <coughs> when the test is complete, you've got three items to throw away. So now there is an alternative. The all-in-one urine pot, a rapid, completely sealed, highly accurate urine testing process. Wow. So located on the doctor's desk is a dispensing box. Um, so just like a fish and chip shop fork, the doctor will take a, a urine pot out of the bottom. The doctor will give the patient the pot. The patient will return it. So from the patient's perspective, nothing else has changed. The doctor's just given me a pot. I filled it up and give it back to them. It's only when it returns back to the doctor is the process different. So the doctor will break the tamper evidence seal that prevents light damaging the chemicals. So he'll break the top, revealing the chemicals inside. He will then press with his finger, breaking a membrane. So there is a foil membrane located in here, and a bung, so that the pin punctures the membrane. The doctor then inverts the pot upside down, allowing urine to soak into the, into the chemicals. The doctor will then pick up a transparent results chart, and he'll then place it directly on top of the pot. So looking from above, the doctor is forced to align the correct results with the correct pad. So he will, he will read the results off at 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds, and at two minutes. So once the test has been completed, there is only um, one item to be discarded or sent to the, labor the laboratory. Um, markets, I, I currently sell products in nine different markets. Um, I've got 32 <coughs> products that I sell I think by the end of this year, it's very difficult to work out, but I think it's 56,000 um, outlets, mainly in North America. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. Excellent. <laughs> Fascinating stuff from, uh, from all black there. Okay, next up we have a presentation on intellectual property rights uh, from Noel Acres. We'll be happy to take you through. Okay.